Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And you've got your bells. Good. Happy Easter. It's a season, not just a day. And every Sunday is a little inbreaking of it anyways, even on other times of the year. All right. Are you ready for a buckle-up kind of announcement morning? Okay. Thanks for your vote of confidence. Uh, the first is an uh, announcement that we're starting a Revelation Bible study on Monday morning in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, that study is at 11 o'clock. I know maybe that book has been on people's minds a little bit more often these past couple of years than other times. This is not a scary thing, but an informative thing meant to comfort. That's what God's Word does always. Um, okay. Also, I need a drum roll. Can you drum roll? Name tags. Yes. If you haven't noticed already, uh, there are some forms. They've got a little square. That's the pretend name tag on the piece of paper in the fellowship hall. And for new members and former members alike, see, it's been a while. It's been a minute since we wore name tags in a new way. Uh, we are going to be getting name tags here in the next handful of weeks. Uh, we're going to be having them made in this big batch that we need. So if you have, for example, misplaced your name tag, uh, now would be the time to put in for a new one. Uh, if you are a new member, we also most likely have your name already on that list, but make sure, here's a couple of things. Make sure that it's spelled correctly, legibly helps. Spelled correctly and that your children, if you have children at church with you, that their names are on there too because kids wear name tags too if you would like. Um, so don't leave them out of the equation. And then we should be off to the races here and everybody will know their name and their neighbor's name in a whole new way. It'll be good. Um, then, let's see, spring cleanup is scheduled for this coming Saturday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. here at church. Um, a lot of mulch needs to be spread, some sprucing up. The buds are on the trees, and that's a really nice thing to see. Um, but the time is now, this coming Saturday, to clean up around the churchyard a little bit. Um, please, if you're able, bring garden gloves of your own, any rakes or shovels, trowels, that kind of a thing. A wheelbarrow, if you have a truck or a trailer, would be lovely. Um, and then uh, we'll be able to hit the ground running at 9 a.m. on Saturday for that. After the spring cleanup, I should mention, uh, Dale Creeble, who has passed away, he's a member, um, his uh, funeral service will be here at the church at 1230. So we'll be kind of two passing ships, um, cars leaving from cleanup day and coming for the funeral at 1230. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where is, oh, okay, I think we're good. I was looking, <laughs> looking for Cheryl Hines, not to scare her. Um, there will be a luncheon following that service. Uh, details are yet to come on that, but 1230 is the, the, the funeral service for Dale Creeble. Uh, later in worship this morning, uh, we'll be having a prayer milestone blessing. So we'll be inviting some folks up to the altar to be blessed, um, as they begin, uh, a prayer life in a new way here at St. Paul. You'll also notice in your announcements to the bulletin, uh, or if you don't have a bulletin, here's your announcement. Um, the Smith Fund, maybe you knew what it was, maybe you don't. The Smith Fund uh, is not regarding the Smith family, but rather a previous Smith family that were members here, um, Lila and Frank Smith, who gave a generous gift uh, to help offset tuition costs for students of LCMS uh, schools, that would be elementary, middle, high school, um, colleges, LCMS colleges, and our two seminaries. So um, that Smith Fund is a little bit low, um, which was a generous gift given, and it's gotten us through many years of use. But this is the moment then to turn it to you all and say if you'd like to continue seeing our, our students who are attending uh, Missouri Synod-affiliated schools and universities and seminaries to be supported and their tuition costs defrayed a bit. Um, you'll notice in the pew in front of you is a small little manila envelope um, that's designated for the Smith Fund. Um, so it doesn't have to be today. It could be the next week or the week after. Um, if you'd like to see that, that fund supported, please do so. Um, and there are some envelopes there that can help designate. Also, a little memo in the check never hurt either. Um, so thank you for that. <clears throat> Paul, if you have any questions. Okay, um, this is perhaps the most involved announcement, but we're getting there. So how many of you attended St. Paul more than two and a half years ago. Okay, no shame in that. How many of you have 
newly come to St. Paul since then. I'm including myself. Okay, so see, we're pretty split, in fact. Uh, we used to give communion, distribute communion around the altar uh, before COVID days, and we're doing that again starting today. You are the first. Yay! Okay. <clears throat> We can clap for that. That's exciting. Okay, so I have a couple of little just roadmap ideas for those of you who it's been a while and those of you who have never done it before. Uh, everything will work out fine. I promise you that uh, by the benediction, everybody will have received communion. Do not fear. But we might, you know, it might be creative getting there the first time. We'll get better as we go. So uh, during the distribution, we will dismiss. The ushers will be on the side aisles out of the middle. It'll be in the side aisle, so you'll excuse from your pew on the side, and you'll come around here. Here, I'll just kind of walk through it. It's easier to see sometimes. All right, so here we are. We're going to communion, and we'll start by filling in from the middle, and then the other side will also be filling in. We sort of alternate. It'll all work out, but just know that you're filling in from the center around the sides, and then when you're here, you're welcome to remain standing or kneel. There is no uh, rail here, but there are some hands to help if that makes the difference. Um, <clears throat> you'll then receive communion. I'll be still distributing the bread, and we'll have two communion assistants this time to distribute the wine, one with an individual tray first, followed by the common cup, and then a dismissal from the communion assistant. And at that point, then, you can return back to your seat from the middle down the center aisle. There'll be an acolyte. Andrew is going to be our acolyte this morning. He's got a basket here that he'll be collecting individual communion cups after you're using them. And then you just file back into your pew from the center aisle. Um, let's see. I think that about covers it. Just follow the ushers. Follow the person in front of you. Say again. Well, thank you. There is a blood drive on Tuesday. Um, <laughs> that was a good segue. Thanks for getting me out of that one, Lynn. Okay. There is a blood drive Tuesday, so if any of you are bakers. Okay, we're just very eager. Yeah, two weeks from now, good. Okay, but we've changed the topic, and it'll all work out for communion. The blood drive is in two weeks. I'll tell you about it next week. Okay, let's stand. <laughs> it's okay. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn, O Christ, Our True and Only Light. O oh Christ, our true and only
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please kneel or remain standing for confession. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most, Most merciful God, God, we confess that we are, we are by nature sinful and unclean. And unclean. We, we have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. This is the
us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our scripture readings. The first reading for the third Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is, n- is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from the Revelation to St. John, chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. By your blood you ransomed people for God 
from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we sing the Alleluia in verse. Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, Lord. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing, they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. But just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This, he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. The congregation can be seated, and I'll invite the kids to come on up for the children's message. While they do that, I am going to get pitcher full of water. I'll meet you in the front middle.
this right here, and I got to bring my bag. What on earth are we going to do today? Well, if you guys want to have a seat on the carpet, you'll be able to see everything. So here, have a seat down here, and I'll show you. There, in our gospel reading, was a man named Peter. Simon Peter, sometimes they call him. And uh, hey, Marion, I need you to sit down here okay, on the carpet. <clears throat> Thank you. There was a man named Peter who loved Jesus very much. He was a disciple. He believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior, just like you believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior too. Now, there was something that happened when Jesus was making his way toward the cross. Now, think back all the way to Holy Week. You remember Holy Week. That's the week just before Easter. When Jesus was, when he was betrayed, and he was carried off, and he was put on trial, there was bunch of people that didn't like Jesus. They were asking him trick questions. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. But one of Jesus' disciples was there and saw all of these things happen. His name was, can you guess it? Who are we talking about today? Peter. Now, there's something that really happened that was sad during Holy Week beyond just Jesus' death. Peter, one of Jesus' very close disciples, denied Jesus you know what that means? Peter said he didn't know Jesus. He didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus because Peter was afraid of what might happen to him. And so Peter denied Jesus, can you guess how many times? Three times. Very good. Now we're going to pretend that this jar of water is like Peter. And this, can anybody read what's on the front of this? What does that say? Sin. Sin. Very good. Jesus, I don't know him, Peter said. People were asking Peter more and more about if he knew Jesus. I swear I don't know him, he says a second time. And a third time, he said, I do not know Jesus. Yuck. Sin makes a mess. Now, some time had gone by, and Peter was very sad because Jesus told him he would deny him three times, and it happened. Peter was upset by it. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb, and on the third day, rose again from the dead. What day was that called? Do you know? Easter. Easter is when Jesus rose from the dead. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he showed up. He revealed himself. That's what that word means. He showed up. He still had the holes in his hands, yep, and his feet. You're right. But Jesus wasn't sick. He wasn't hurt, and he wasn't dead anymore. He was alive because, are you ready to yell with me? You get to do my part, okay? Christ is risen. Your part. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Okay. So because Jesus was alive, he showed himself to all of his disciples, even to Peter, and that's what we just heard today. When Jesus showed himself again to Peter, he said something kind of funny, but he did it three times. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus asked a second time, Peter do you love me more than all of these people and all of these things? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Take care of my church. And then a third time, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Peter said, you know all things, Lord. You know that I love you. And guess what? Just like that, all of Peter's sin, <clears throat> all of his denying Jesus before, went away. 
Jesus made sure that Peter knew, <laughs> not quite, Jesus knew that Peter, or I'm sorry, Peter knew that Jesus loves him just the way he loves each and every one of you. Even when, even when you sin, Jesus forgives you. And he says, I know how much you love me because I love you more. He died and rose again to show you that much and that your sins too are forgiven and you're made clean. You're washed clean from your sins too. And Jesus makes sure that you all know that by, careful, don't lean too hard, by telling you in his word that he loves and forgives you, by sending you pastors who tell you what Jesus... That's right. <laughs> she does call me dad at home, I promise. That pastors are there to tell you that Jesus loves and forgives you. And guess what? You guys are even here for each other's sake to tell you, to tell each other that God, that Jesus loves and forgives you. That's a very sure and certain word. So will you pray with me? Can you fold your hands? And you can repeat after me. Congregation, you can help. Thank you, Lord Jesus, Thank you, Lord Jesus. For, forgiving us for forgiving us and cleansing us from all of our sins. Keep us happy and joyful because of your forgiveness. Amen. Thank you for coming up today, you guys. You can head back to your seats.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. This was now the third time that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, I'm sure that probably you've heard the phrase, repetition is the mother of learning, or something like it. Practice makes perfect. Repetition in this case, though. And so Jesus doesn't appear to his disciples just one time after his resurrection, but many times. One thing that Jesus wants his disciples of all times and places to know, the most important thing, the one thing, as Paul said, that Christianity, the way, cannot do without is the resurrection. That yes, Jesus was dead, really dead, really actually buried in the tomb, but he is now risen from the dead. And so sin and its author, the devil, and its wages, its repercussions, its result, death, they have all been conquered by Jesus. Because of this, the way things were is not the way things are now. Jesus is making all things new. New, not by destroying sin and everything sin has infected, and a great death and starting over. Like in our when it's broke and throw it away, buy a new one kind of world, that's the way we think. But our loving God does not make throwaways. So Jesus is making all things new, one person at a time, conquering sin, the devil, and sin's wages in us by giving us the victory, the forgiveness of our sins so that we too live a new life. In the gospel account we heard today, it highlights that truth because it's a story that we've heard before. Luke 5 tells us. We get a kind of before and after snapshot of the way things were and now the way things are with the newness of life that Jesus brings. So this is the Luke 5 moment. About three years before this breakfast on the beach moment takes place, at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Peter and James and John cleaning their nets. They were fishing all night. And just like we heard today, they had caught nothing. So Jesus tells them then, like he does today, try again. And when they do, they catch so many fish that their nets begin to break. And both of their boats begin to sink. And when Peter realizes that this has just happened, the miracle of God and his power revealed Peter falls on his knees and says, Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. That's the before picture. But in today's reading, it's a little different. Peter is changed, transformed. After this miraculous catch of fish, after John says to Peter, It's the Lord, this time Peter is not afraid. This time, in fact, Peter can't wait to get to Jesus. He puts on his outer garments. Before the other disciples know it, Peter jumps into the water, swimming to get to Jesus as fast as he can. And I love it. In the, in the text, it says, and then the other disciples brought the boat ashore. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. And the net of fish. Before Easter, Peter knew only the weight of his sin. Before Easter, Peter is afraid to be in the presence of God. Before Easter, Peter tells Jesus to leave him. But now, after Easter, after the resurrection, and the peace that Jesus gave, even as we heard last week when they were locked up for fear, Peter knows the forgiveness of Jesus, and he is no longer afraid. In fact, prefers now to come to Jesus, sinful in need of forgiveness and cleansing and renewal. So first notice this. Jesus has not changed. Easter does not mean that he's now all done with all his work and it's now up to us to do it. No. Jesus is still working. What he did before Easter, he still does after Easter. Jesus is now not just all spiritual-like. 
He's still working through the physical, still working through means, even through the disciples' calling or their vocation as fishermen. That didn't change, and it won't change after Easter. What changed, however, is the disciples. What changed is us. Jesus' death and resurrection were not to make Jesus new, but to make us new, to raise us from our sin, from our fear, from death, sorry, and have a new life in him. Not a new super-spiritualized life, but a new life in our callings, in the flesh, in all of our vocations. That's not just professions, but vocations, relationships, friends, family, neighbors. Not to take us, not to take you out of this world and put you in some spiritual realm, but to make you new in this world. And we see that in Peter. He's a changed man, and so are we. And yet it seems that there's something on Peter's mind right after this Jesus who knows all that we need and provides all that we need, asks Peter three times, do you love me? Three times, which mirror Peter's three denials of Jesus just a few days before. Remember, this is not weeks gone by, but days since the resurrection. Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to not deny, but to confess him. That's the what of what's happening here. The question is why. Was Peter somehow earning Jesus' forgiveness? Absolutely not. Jesus died for Peter's denials on the cross. All the sin of all the people of all the world, including Peter's sins and yours and mine, were on Jesus on the cross. That has been finished. Jesus doesn't bring it up even. He doesn't get historical about the times that Peter denied him. But if Peter's like me, and if he's like you too, even after you know that you're forgiven, sometimes you still have regrets. You still have those nagging voices in your head. Our Lord may forgive our iniquities and remember our sins no more, like he says through the prophet Jeremiah, just like we heard during Holy Week. But it's not always so easy for us to forget our sins. We remember. Oftentimes, I forget the good things, but I can't seem to forget the things, the sins, the mistakes, the regrets, the wish I could do that one over again. Those are the kinds of sins that can haunt, the ones that Satan throws back in your face throws them in mine. And so it's not that Jesus was holding his sin against Peter. Peter was holding his sin against himself. Sometimes the hardest person to forgive is yourself. Jesus lovingly gives Peter three more chances to confess him. Peter needs this. Now maybe you're thinking, it's not the same. It's easy to confess Jesus in front of Jesus where it's safe easy to confess Jesus in front of Jesus where it's safe. But out there, it's difficult. It's really challenging. This is what Peter needed now. It did make a difference for him. Do we see a new Peter? Well, Yes, we do. And not just here, but later as well. The Peter who was so afraid of death before that he denied knowing Jesus three times would later go to his own death, confessing Jesus, glorifying him in his death. Jesus tells him ahead of time that it will be so. Peter, the denier, would be Peter, the martyr, filled with faith in the face of death. Not to Peter's credit but because of the death and resurrection of Jesus working in him. The same death and resurrection of Jesus that's working in you too. 
Maybe we don't know what we're going to face in the future, but Jesus knows, and he is preparing you for it, making you new for it, just like he did for Peter. The second thing to take note of in this gospel today is what Jesus calls his disciples as they're out fishing. He says to them, children, do you have any fish? Children. They're children here, not disciples, not apostles by name. Those two titles focus on what they do, those who learn and those who are sent, disciples and apostles. But children, to call somebody a child focuses on who they are, focuses on what God has done. Because no one does anything to make themselves a child. Being a child is something that happens to you. You're either born or adopted into a family. So child is about who you are. Which is important here, again, because what the disciples did again was fail. They were out all night again and caught nothing. They denied, they betrayed, they doubted, they ran away, they hid, and the going got tough. How often we also fail in our vocations, in our lives, in the things God has given us to do. But that doesn't change our status as children of God. Children don't have to earn their way into the family or earn their keep in it. They're loved because they're children. So it is with the disciples. So it is with Paul, even. Jesus made his child, even though Paul was working against Jesus, so it is with us. We're children of God because we've been made so in the waters of holy baptism, some of you in this very church building. In those waters, Jesus came to you and said, you are mine. And so you are. And that was an Easter day for you too. For all of us, the day when we, as Paul would write later in one of his letters to the Romans, when you died with Christ and were raised with him to live a new life or to walk in newness of life. So these fishermen who don't seem to be able to catch any fish, Jesus will use to be his fishers of men. And they would not do so because of their ability just as out on the lake Jesus would be working. Working now also through his spirit, providing the catch, working through them and us. If you ever think that you're too much a failure for Jesus to use you, if you feel ever that you are too much a failure as a parent, or a grandparent, or a great-grandparent, a child, a friend, a spouse, a Christian, or whatever else your calling is and your place to be is in this life, just remember these disciples and take heart. If Jesus wants them as his children and can transform and use them, then he will do the same with you. And the third thing, the final thing to take away from this gospel today is a picture of the kingdom of God coming to us. That's what we pray for, don't we? When we pray the Lord's Prayer, when we say, Thy kingdom come, those words, we're not just praying for God's kingdom of glory, heaven to come, and the world to end. Not just that. We're also, at the same time, praying for God's kingdom of mercy and grace to come to us here and now. His kingdom that came right there on the the seashore of Galilee that day. His kingdom that came to Paul on the road to Damascus. And his kingdom that comes to us here today, unworthy as we are, with his word and spirit and forgiveness makes us his own. Many people pray, thy kingdom come, and think only of the scene we heard in the epistle, the second reading, 
from Revelation with angels and thrones and all of that. Certainly. But more than that, God's kingdom is bigger than that. The readings we heard today show us that he is active and he is here with us even now bringing us a foretaste of that kingdom here on earth. It breaks in ahead of time. That kingdom of God, you are citizens of even now. In all of your various vocations, all your walks of life, active now as you raise your families, as you work, as you visit friends, even as you go fishing, and most importantly, active for us as he comes to us in his word and his sacraments, giving us faith, forgiving us, transforming us, and making us new. Not just once, but many times. And so it is a new Peter who jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore and gets to Jesus soaking wet. Peter is dripping. That's what you look like too when you come to Jesus, soaking wet from the water of baptism. Soaking wet from jumping into those waters every single day when you confess your sins and receive God's forgiveness and are made new. And when we remember that in the water and by the word that we are children of God, we are assured that God's kingdom is among us, that it has come to you. Not only do we live soaking wet from baptism in God's kingdom here on earth, Jesus also calls us to come and eat. Not fish over a campfire this time, but he has prepared a meal around this altar for us. Bread and wine, his very body and blood, that you would again be forgiven and your new life sustained so that you know that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love eating now even a foretaste, a morsel, a hint of what will be when God's kingdom comes in its fullness on that last day, when you sit at the banquet table, the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. This is a bit of that now. Until then, we join choir in heaven, and their song to the Lord. We sing a new song. We sing because we're made new. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God, children of God, power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor and blessing and glory are his. This is the feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us continue by confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We'll invite those students and parents, prayer partners also, who have participated in the prayer milestone to come forward for this special blessing and receive their prayer pillows. <laughs> Bring your prayer pillows. <clears throat> come on up. And we gather to remember that these folks are on a journey of faith along with us that continues today and the rest of their lives. Regardless of their age, they're beloved children of God. That is who you are. So congregation, please respond. Help us, Lord, to continue our journey with you. Help us, Lord, to, to continue, continue our, our journey, journey with, with you. you. Prayer partners, you are called to pray for these students and their families for the next year. Will you walk alongside these children and their families, listen carefully, share sensitively, encourage cheerfully, greet enthusiastically, and pray diligently? If so, answer, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. People of God, members of St. Paul, will you support these families and prayer partners during this journey? Will you pray for them that new relationships may grow? and each person's faith may be strengthened? If so, answer, yes, with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. Let us pray. Lord God, we lift up these prayer partners and families to walk with one another in faith. Bless them with opportunities to practice their faith when they rise and when they go to bed, when they are at home and when they are away. Strengthen them with the support of this Christian community as they grow in the faith and knowledge of you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, the prayer partners will hand the prayer pillows to their students. The prayer pillows are reminders to pray. When I lie down at night on my pillow or rest my head on a pillow anywhere, any time during the day, I sink in and I relax. If it's traveling in a car or an airplane, I lay my head back and let the driver or pilot be in charge. If it's my bed pillow, I let God be in charge all night. This prayer pillow is to help you remember to let God be in charge and care for you and provide for you all day and night, wherever you are, whatever is happening. Your prayer pillow has a pocket there for you to keep some of your favorite prayers on some cards or little pieces of paper. And there's a book in there also, and a prayer on a slip of paper. And all of us in worship this morning will pray together. So, you all and the congregation, please repeat this prayer with me. Let's pray. O oh, good and loving God. O oh, good and loving God. You made me and gave me everything I need. You made me and gave me everything I need. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness. And the gift of Jesus, my friend. And the gift of Jesus, my friend. Help me always relax in your love and care. Help me always relax in your love and care. Help me live each day and night for you. Help me live each day and night for you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Prayers have been requested this morning uh, for the family of Barb Wall, uh, Bob Walls Sr. This is Bob Walls, whom we know here at St. Paul. This is Bob's father who has passed away. We pray also for Evelyn, a friend of our family from up north who is recovering from a surgery. For Shirley Masson, whose surgery last week was not able to be completed. Uh, 
you're here today, and that's a thankful thing. Uh, but we'll continue to pray for you, Shirley, uh, as we're awaiting a new treatment plan for you. Prayer for Pat Mitchell, uh, who's recovering at home from a stay in the hospital during Holy Week and Easter. Uh, she has a, a new diagnosis which affects her heart. We pray for her strength and comfort. We pray for safe travel for Christine and Steve Theros, for continued healing for Alex, Ray, and Karen Wood's daughter following her surgery, for Jean Brody, Lisa Garsh's sister, who requests our prayers for strength and healing for an undiagnosed illness. We give thanks to God for his blessings upon Jillian Pless as she graduates from college and all other college graduates. We pray for the family of Dale Creeble, who passed away last week. For Judy, Cliff's mother, who's healing from an infection. For Catherine, a little girl we prayed for even during Lent. Uh, she's a year and a half. She's had brain surgery to remove a tumor. 83% of it has been removed. She almost died on Easter Sunday, but rallied through, thanks be to God. Uh, a lot of recovery is still needed for this little girl, so we pray for her healing from our great physician. We pray for George Lawrence, uh, who even since Easter uh, is now on hospice care. We pray for uh, the family of Barb Baumgartner. Uh, Barb is a longtime member of our congregation. She passed away Friday morning. And we pray also for uh, Raymond Day, Lorraine's son, who is having some medical treatments upcoming. And also for our families, our milestone families and their prayer partners, as well as our entire congregation, that we may rededicate ourselves to the practice of prayer. Please stand. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you have raised your Son from the dead to the praises of angels and saints. Give strength to our hearts and voices that we, along with them, would meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and speak of the might of your awesome deeds. Lord, in your mercy, ever-living God, you raised up Saul from among your enemies, that even he would proclaim your name rather than persecute it. In your mercy, continue to call men to the office of the holy ministry of your church. Bless all those, even in our own church body, who have recently received calls to the parish to serve. Call also and sustain your missionaries here and throughout the world, especially the Odemba, Esla and Sharp families, continue to grant wisdom and strength through your Holy Spirit to those whom you desire to call your own. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers and grant us the assurance that you do through Jesus. Be among the families and members of our congregation that we may be a people at prayer, confidently raising our petitions to you for ourselves one another, and for our world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, enthroned in heaven, you have ordered all the nations of the earth and have set your church among them to shepherd them to eternal life. Hear the prayers we continually offer for our national, state, and local leaders and grant them diligence and humility as they serve. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate Lord, you are glorified, even in the sufferings of your faithful people. Grant us a peace and a trust to you through all our trials, and graciously bear up those who stand in need of healing and strength of body and soul. Especially today, we pray for the family of Bob Walls, Sr., for Dale's family and Barb's family, for Shirley, for Pat, for Alex, Jean, Judy, Catherine, George, and Raymond. Grant, O oh Lord, that they would know the fullness of your love, now and always. Lord, in your mercy. Receive our thanks for the blessings you've given to all students, 
to Jillian and those who graduate this year from college. Continue to bless them in all their vocations, current and yet unknown, granting them trust and assurance that you lead and guide them to glorify your name in all that they do. Lord, in your mercy, grant safe travels for the Theroses and for all our friends and family who make their way from one to another place. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord, you've prepared a feast again for us on this morning of your son's resurrection. Help us to rejoice greatly in this gift of his body and blood and to receive it to our eternal good that we too would rise at the last day. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, dear Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated as our worship continues by gathering our offerings. Please stand. We'll continue with the service of the sacrament on page 161. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, and most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
safely stand. Now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Let all who seek the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He recalls his promises and leads his people forth in joy with shouts of thanksgiving. pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.